those of you who may not know me, my name is Joe Wilkenberg. I'm one of the uh, writers of tonight's uh, comedy show. Uh, I'm here now to, uh, before we get started, to ask that you turn off any cell phones you have in your possession. I don't mind if you take pictures, but please turn off your flash. The Fox Hills Comedy Troupe welcomes you to a celebration of the golden age of television. Except, if you remember, it wasn't golden, it was black and white. <laughs> you could hardly see, for all the snow, spread the rabbit ears as far as they go. Pull up a chair to the TV set. Good night, David. Good night, Chet. Depending on the channel you tuned, you got Rob and Laura, or Ward and June. It felt so good. It felt so right. Life looked better in black and white. I love Lucy, the real McCoys, Dennis the Menace, the Cleaver Boys, Rye, Gunsmoke, Wagon Train, Superman Jimmy, and Lois Lane. Father Knows Best, Patty Duke, Rin Tin Tin, and Lassie too. Donna Reed on Thursday night, life looked better in black and white. I want to go back to black and white. Everything always turned out right. Simple people, simple lives. Good guys always won the fights. Now, nothing is the way it seems in living color on the TV screen. Too many murders, too many fights. I want to go back to black and white. In God they trusted, alone they slept. A promise made was a promise kept. They never cussed or broke their vows. They never make the network now. <laughs> but if I could, I'd rather be in a TV town in 53. It felt so good. It felt so right. Life looked better in black and white. I'd trade all the channels on the satellite if I could just turn back the clock tonight to when everybody knew wrong from right. Life was better in black and white. Ladies and gentlemen, it brings me great pleasure tonight to take you back to the golden years of television. There was a time TV was young, many comics being new to the mediums, were adventurous and tried new and imaginative ideas. Perhaps you didn't know, but Uncle Milky, looking girl, drew such a large audience on Tuesday nights that retailers suffered a financial loss due to lack of customers. The industry decided to close early on Tuesdays for this reason and retained that <coughs> customer for many years thereafter. Now, let's recall the early days of TV. I should know because I was there from the very beginning. Around 1939, we got TV sets. Two inches. <coughs> We can now watch thousands of years of history for the first time. If you can prove. Five members of my family, four neighbors, two cousins, and three people I never saw before, <laughs> all cramped around this tiny little screen. How's our blood? Boy, was it cramped. But soon came a great improvement. You might ask, what was it? 
a magnifying glass. It wasn't exactly new, but it was around for a few hundred years. But the idea to put it in front of our tiny TV screen was magnificent. We could almost breathe. Not so fast. You see, with this magnifying glass, you couldn't see on the side. You could only see in the front. So, again, you were cramped. But then, as technology advanced, we had a 5-inch, a 7-inch, and an 11-inch screen. Well, TV was heavy on variety shows. The Milton Girl show, the Sid Caesar show, and the Laughing show. Speaking of laughing, they had this wall, similar to the one behind me, where we can call the famous talking wall. Mr. George Washington was the father of our country and never told a lie. I wouldn't say that was exactly true about Mr. Washington. Why do you say that? When his father asked him, did you cut down a cherry tree? He said, Papa did it. <laughs> Remember, half the people you know are below average. <laughs>
Joe would like to present to you now. For those of you who are not familiar with this <coughs> mind reading trick, Joe will attempt to answer the question before he opens the envelope. He will then open each envelope and read the question aloud so you can hear for yourselves how well he predicted the answer. Joe's sidekick, that famous DJ, Bob Aronson, will repeat the answer to be sure you have heard it before each question is revealed. Have these envelopes been sealed? Oh, yes. These envelopes have been hermetically sealed and frozen and kept inside Funk and Wackle's laboratory. <laughs> Predict the first thing here is going to be dippity do. Dippity do. <laughs> what collects on your dippity in the morning? Marks. Zippo marks. What do you get when something gets caught in your zippo? <laughs> Touch back. What's the smart thing to do if a Dallas cowgirl touches you? <laughs> kitchy, kitchy, coo. Kitchy, kitchy, coo. What do you call a military coup led by General Kitchy Kitchy? <laughs> Catch 22. <laughs> <laughs> what do the Mets do with a hundred pop up slides? <laughs> 9W. 9W. What did Professor Clark say when asked, Does the letter X come after the letter V? 9W. <laughs> The third. <laughs> what do you tell the bartender who gives you three shot glasses but only pours into two? <laughs> <laughs> Steroids. Steroids. What do you get from sitting on top of the stereo? <laughs> Systems go. <laughs> what happens if you take a sanitary buffet in the mailbox all together? <laughs> <laughs> Good year, Tuck and Pinocchio. Good year, Tuck and Pinocchio. Name a tire, a fryer, and a liar. <laughs> Sis boom ba. Sis boom ba. Describe the sound made when a sheep explodes. <laughs> Eskimo pie. Eskimo pie. What is the ratio of an igloo circumference to its diameter? <laughs> 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 Thank you. 
Lord who took place. Perhaps you've heard about it. It was called the Ten Commandments. <coughs> Did you ever wonder why there are ten? We don't need that many. I think the list of commandments was deliberately and artificially inflated to get it up to ten. It's clearly a padded list. How did this happen? Well, I think the religious leaders got together back then, and they decided to tell the people they had ten commandments that everybody had to obey. Why did they pick ten? I'll tell you all. Because ten sounds important. Ten sounds official. They knew if they said they had six commandments, People would say, what are you kidding me? Six commandments? Get out of here. <laughs> but, Ten Commandments sounds official and sounds important. It's the basis of the decimal system. You have ten fingers. It's a satisfying a psychological number. Clearly, it was a marketing decision. You take the top ten. The ten most wanted, the ten best dressed. Now, I'm going to tell you how you can reduce that number and come up with a streamlined and more logical amount. Let's take the first three. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no strange God before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt keep holy the Sabbath. Well, right off the bat, the first three are about revering God. So, we could, why not just say, Revere the Lord thy God and the Sabbath. Revere the Lord thy God and the Sabbath. Now we're down to eight. <laughs> Let's take the next, the next command. Honor thy father and mother. This commandment is about obedience and respect. Well, obedience and respect should not be granted automatically. They should be earned. They should be based on a parent's performance. <laughs> Truth is, some parents deserve respect, others don't. Period. So we're down to seven. <laughs> now skipping around a bit. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Stealing and lying. Actually, when you think about it, these two commandments cover the same sort of behavior. Dishonest. So we don't need two of them. Instead, we combine them and we call it, Thou shalt not be dishonest. Thou shalt not be dishonest. <coughs> Suddenly we're down to six. And as long as we're combining commandments, there are two others that belong together. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Once again, these two prohibit the same sort of behavior. The only difference is, coveting takes place in the mind. But marital fidelity is a good idea. So I suggest that we call this commandment, Thou shalt not be unfaithful. Thou shalt not be unfaithful. Now we're down to five. And when you think about it further, honesty and fidelity are actually parts of the same overall value. So in truth, we can combine the two honesty commandments with the two fidelity commandments and using positive language instead of negative, we could call the whole thing, Thou shalt always be honest and faithful. Thou shalt always be honest and faithful. There we go. Now we're down to four. Let's hear another one. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. This one is just unrealistic. Coveting your neighbor's goods is what keeps the economy going. <laughs> your neighbor gets a new widescreen, flat panel, high definition, definition TV. You want one too. Coveting creates jobs and stimulates the economy. You throw out coveting goods and you're down to three. Revere the Lord thy God, the big honesty fidelity commandment, 
And the one we haven't mentioned yet. Thou shalt not kill. Murder, the fifth commandment. If you give it a little thought, you realize that religion has never really had a big problem with murder. <laughs> More people, after all, have killed in the name of religion than for any other reason. For example, take the Irish history, the Middle East, the Crusades, the Inquisition, to see how seriously religion takes murder. Well, Apparently, it depends on who's doing the killing and who's getting killed. So now I offer you folks my revised list of three commandments. Thou shalt revere thy God and the Sabbath. Thou shalt always be honest and faithful. Thou shalt try real hard not to kill anybody. <laughs> So three is all you need, folks. Moses could have carried them down in his pocket. <laughs> and we want to thank George Carlin for that bit. And we want to thank all of you for not being offended and accepting this as a joke the way we intended it. Thank you. Keep in the African jungles about this time, an early TV genius, Ernie Kovacs, came upon a musical tribe of apes. We have been successful, as you can see, bringing them to Fox Hills tonight. Let's have a big hand for the Nairobi trio playing for us the hit record called Fabio.
Ma'am, does your head husband ever beat you up? Yes, about twice a week. He gets up earlier than I do. <laughs> And I've always said, when you reach a fork 
the road? Take it. I think you had better put an end to this. Right, Judge, but remember, it ain't over till it's over. It's over. Yogi, you're out. said, 
Does this taste funny to you? <laughs> Speaking about funny things, a man just got finished with his annual physical, and the doctor came out, said, you did great. Is there anything you want to tell me or to discuss with me? The man thought for a moment and said, yes, doctor. I'm thinking of having a vasectomy. The doctor stopped and said, that's a serious decision. Have you spoken to your family about it? Yes, said the man. And they agreed, 44 to 12. Back to Stanley's restaurant. We wait a month and a half for an appointment, sit in their office for an hour and a half, and the first thing they say when they see you is, Why didn't you see me sooner? <laughs> My wife escorted me to a doctor the other day. Funny thing happened in New York. The doctor kept walking around and telling my wife how pretty she looked. As I walked out of the office, I said to the receptionist, does this doctor always do that? She said, yes, he's a complimentary doctor. <laughs> <coughs> There's a man that he's a man he a doctor. Looks like he was built upside down. Why? His nose runs and his feet smell. <laughs> Two cows are talking to each other. One cow said to the other, this morning, I got it, it was artificially inseminated. The other cow looked and said, I don't believe you. The first cow said, the first cow said yes, no bull. <laughs> so speaking about bull, a farmer and his wife went to a bull auction. The auctioneer came out, said, look at this first specimen. It has 60 reproductions last year. The wife hit the husband and said, look at that, Harry. Five times each month, five times better than you. <laughs> what the second bull asked this one had 120 reproductions last year. She hit the husband again. She said, that's 10 times a month. Now what's wrong with you, Harry? Finally, the auctioneer came out and said, this is the best specimen we have. Last year, it had 365 reproductions. <laughs> The wife hit the husband again and said, that's once a day, Harry, once a day. Harry said, yeah, once a day. But ask the auctioneer if he was always with the same cow. <laughs> There's a man who got a haircut. Looks like he got it in the pet shop. Well, he's getting angry at me. I swear I'll kill you a million times. And there's another one over here that looks like a saint, Saint Bernard. Yeah. <laughs> The man next to her is called laryngitis. You know why it's called laryngitis? He's a real pain in the neck. <laughs> Fox Hill, as you may know, called me, or you may not know this, but Fox Hill called me last night. He said, Mr. Burrow, you did not pay your maintenance bill. I'm giving you two days to pay it. I said, great. I'll take Christmas and the 4th of July. <laughs> <laughs> Fox Hills, a lady in my apartment looked out the window and she saw something off and she called the police. Every night at 9 p.m. on the building across the street, a man walks around completely nude. The police came over the next day, 9 o'clock, they looked out and said, lady, we don't see anything. She said, stand on the windowsill, stand on the windowsill. <laughs> And the walls in Fox Hill, as you probably may know, are very, very thin. Last night, I overheard my next door neighbor, Murray and Beverly, talking. <coughs> Beverly was in a romantic mood. She said, Murray, remember when we were courting, you always used to hold my hand. Murray turned around angrily, grabbed the hand for a second, and turned back to try to go back to sleep. Beverly thought for a moment and said, Murray, when we were courting, you always used to kiss me. I returned around one more time, pecked her cheek very quickly, then turned back, trying to go to sleep. However, Beverly was still in a romantic mood. She said, remember the last thing you always used to do, Murray? You used to bite my neck. At that, Murray jumped out of bed and started running to the door. Beverly said, Murray, Murray, where are you going? He said, to get my goddamn teeth. <laughs>
leave a message for you? Yes, can you do that for me? You are not dealing with just anyone's fool. Oh, I am a high school graduate. <laughs> uh, well, well, would there be any cost involved? Here at the phone company, we handle 84 billion calls a year, serving everyone from presidents and kings to the scum of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> would you care about taking money from you from leaving a message? We don't care, but that's your problem, isn't it? Next time you complain about your phone service, why don't you try using two Dixie cups with a string? <laughs> we don't care. We don't have to. <laughs> we're at the phone company. Operator, I am not sure what you were saying. Yeah. Will this cost me any money? Or is this privileged information? Pardon? Privileged information? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that's so cute. No, no, no. You're dealing with the telephone company. We are not subject to city, state, or federal registration. We are on the potent. <laughs> okay, thanks, operator. I would like to leave a message at the clubhouse for Joe Wolkenberg. Is that like W, like in wool? O, like in oh yeah. L, like in lumber? K, like in kangaroo? E, like in everything, and like in nothing. Sir? Please make up your mind, or I am very busy. Is it everything or nothing? But operator, I am phonetically speak, spelling the name just as you. Excuse me, sir, how do you speak phonetically? <laughs> Only fooling me. Everyone tries to imitate our great telephone company. I understand. But please let me continue. E like in enough, N like in nonsense, B like in bicycle. Get the idea, sir? E like in every time, R like in ravioli, and G like in the filter fish. <laughs> what else do you expect from the phone company? Never mind, Alberta. I think I see Joe coming now. Well, if that's the way you feel about it, sir, I cannot return any of your money. <coughs> Thanks for using the telephone company.
Welcome back, everybody, to cool and old-time entertainment. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> and I think the cast at this point, although the show's not over, the cast and crew deserve a big round of your applause. <laughs> at this point, I'd like to relate this joke. I heard this joke recently, and I'd like to relate it to you now. A drunk walks into a tavern, sat down at the bar, ordered a beer, and took a small cardboard box out of his inside pocket, put it on the bar, and then ordered the beer. When the beer came, he reached into the box, pulled out a piano and a frog, sat the frog down on the piano, and said, play. The frog immediately began to play the piano. It played all the favorites and some classical music, and then launched into contemporary jazz. The man ordered another beer, and when it came, he reached into the cardboard box and pulled out a little white mouse. He sat the mouse on top of the piano and said, sing. The frog began to play the piano. The mouse began to sing. First some oldies but goodies, then the current favorites, and then some classical music. A man at the bar who was watching all of this approached the man and offered to buy the little outfit that the man had. And after a bit of negotiating, the drunk agreed to sell it to the man for $500. The man gathered everything into the cardboard box and ran out the door before the drunk could change his mind. The bartender had been watching all of this on the side and said to the drunk, you damned old fool, you just sold that little outfit you had for $500 and you could have made millions out of it. The drunk laughed heartily and replied, I'm not the fool, that guy who bought it is. Do you really think I would have sold that if the mouse could really sing? <laughs> the bartender responded, what do you mean? I stood here and listened to that mouse sing. The joke is on you and the guy who bought the outfit. That mouse can't sing. The frog is a ventriloquist. <laughs> Speaking of ventriloquists, let's listen to Mr. Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy discussing what items they should consider for inclusion into the upcoming Fox Hills Courier. <laughs> Charlie, would you like to say hello to the nice people in Fox Hills? Hello, nice Fox Hills people. Okay, item number one, Charlie. I heard that Fox Hills Board attempted to meet the growing need of our community by starting an apathy support group. Yes, unfortunately, the meeting was canceled due to lack of interest. <laughs> Nurse Kay in our wellness center claims to have discovered a new wonder drug. The only side effect is when women take it, they feel compelled to join a convent. The FDA has refused to license the drug. That's right. They say it's habit forming. <laughs> what about this article? Joe Olkenberg from the Camera Club is now promising 24-hour film development. His motto is, one day my prince will come. Yeah. <laughs> Here's another item, Charlie. Fox Hills was on the world stage last week as we hosted the annual champion chess tournament. However, controversy erupted when several participants were kicked out of the clubhouse lobby by Jack Quinn after sitting around for hours bragging about their past achievements and awards. Jack, the business manager, has refused to comment on why he did this. Well, isn't it obvious? He just hates chestnuts boasting by an open foyer. <laughs> <laughs> Morristown, who has compiled the world's, world's largest collection of toilets. Unfortunately, the flimsy grass hut couldn't support the weight of all those toilets. And yesterday they came crashing to the floor, destroying most of his collection. It goes to show you, people who live in grass houses shouldn't stow thrones. <laughs> Milton, known as the mean in his ways, and create a more likable image. 
even went so far as to offer to dress up like Santa at the annual Christmas party. However, it became apparent that it would take some time for this new image to set in when his own child refused to climb up in his lap and tell him what he wanted for Christmas. You know what they say, the sun never sits on the British Empire. <laughs> Charlie, did you hear this? this one? Police in Denver have been unable to track down a criminal who has been shooting down seagulls with a slingshot. They'd better find him soon, or leave no turn unstoned. <laughs> Another one, Charlie. NASA made it known today they are back embarking on a four-year plan that would culminate in a space shuttle lasting over the year 2009, carrying 12 head of cattle into orbit. Will be known as the herd shot round the world. <laughs> I should be recall, include that an exciting discovery was made in the field of archaeology last week as the team uncovered the tomb where Napoleon and most of his immediate family were buried. Unfortunately, they couldn't tell one bone apart from another. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this, Charlie. It says recent medical research indicates that there's a new strain of bacteria that causes kleptomania in those who infect. Can't you take something for that? <laughs> <laughs> and now, <laughs> close to ladies and gentlemen, I will drink a glass of water while singing Tinkle Tinkle Little Star. <laughs> That's Twinkle Tinkle Little Star. No, Charlie, you know what happens to me when I drink too much water. <laughs>
Wait, here's a, last, a late bulletin. It is reported that two men have just stolen four cases of Viagra from a warehouse in New York. The police have pointed out that these men are dangerous and should now be considered hardened criminals. News <laughs> <laughs> of the future, year 2020, United States, first election results. The election results are now coming in from the first internet voting in the United States. Rudolf Giuliani, 3,500,000. Hillary Clinton, 3,600,000. Bill Gates, 173,900,000. The software rivals of Microsoft are demanding a recount. When asked by this reporter why the rivals did not manufacture their own version of Windows so that they could set up their own voting booths, they answered, Sorry, we don't do Windows. <laughs> More news of the future. Year 2020, Washington. Secretary of State Ann Coulter announced today that she has recommended Michael Moore to be the new Secretary of Communication in the recently revised Truth Squad formed by President-elect Sean Hannity. President-elect Hannity once more claimed that his administration is fair and balanced and that disappointment should silence his critics. Alan Combs, from his cell in San Quentin, refused any comment, although the underground copy of the New York Times and the new condo connection oh. by him, expressed the view that Mr. Moore appeared to have had brain surgery after claiming to have been abused by his prison guards in Washington, D.C. More news of the future, year 2020, New Jersey. The Rockaway Condominium Association said that they expect the engineering report regarding the <laughs> by sometime this winter. When asked about the unusual delay, the president of the association, Jim Dunn, allegedly said, everyone has their mind in the gutter at Fox Service. <laughs> Meanwhile, the soil removal for the completion of the last two buildings have now gone back and forth from Bodner to Giant and back from Giant to Bodner 36 times. The main concern is that each time the movement of soil is made, about 3,000 pounds are lost on the highway. At this time, over 432 vehicles have complained of broken windshields. It was also announced by the association at Fox Hills that the two unfinished buildings will finally be ready for occupancy sometime in 2025. <laughs> Good. New reservations are now open, as the original reservations made 20 years ago have expired under the statute of limitations. <laughs> and some of the people who have made these reservations have also expired. <laughs> Or 
fig leaves in the earliest of Earth's known years. They wore them through spring and through summer, labeling them his and hers. They caught dreadful colds, though, soon after. At least historians so recall. The fig leaves were swelled in the summer. But what happened to those leaves in the fall? <laughs> I'd love to be, I'd 
love to be a bass. I climb upon a slippery rock and slide down on my <laughs> another poem. A careful commercial female had prices tattooed on her tail. For the sake of the blind, beneath her behind, a duplicate version in gray. <laughs> <laughs> Catch the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. 
<laughs> Sir, I'd like to talk with you for a moment. Can you tell me your name? Don't you recognize me? I am Red Buttons, and I've been around for 75 years. Oh, hey, <laughs> things are happening. Just came back from a seven-day Polish, uh, Polish cruise. Seven days, three nights. <laughs> <laughs> So 
only people 55 and over. But you're the right, baby. You're the greatest. But Ralph, you are over 55. But I ain't those looking. I told you you should listen to me more often. Now tell me, Ralph, what is so important about being home by 7 p.m. today? Alice, don't you remember? Take it or leave it as on tonight. You're going to pick the winner of the show. The winner gets $64 and a free trip to Hollywood. Oh, Ralph, your chances are over 500 to 1. You really don't think you're going to be picked, do you? 500 to 1? Alice, where do you get those crazy odds? How do you make up such stupid numbers? You never have faith in me, Alice. Of course I expect to have my name picked. After all, <laughs> Norton and I spent six days filming out entries and sending them in. Why, we must have... Ralphie Boy. Yes, <laughs> that I They picked the winner and take it or leave it. Are you ready to go to Hollywood? Down, down, down. The odds are over 500 to 1. Thank you, Norton. If they can read your handwriting, the odds would be cut down to about five to one. And with my entries, we should be favorites to win. Huh. Well, Ralph, it's almost 7 p.m. You better set up the radio to see if your name is called. Yeah, yeah. Come on, let's see. Boy, it's almost 7 o'clock. It's CBS. Ralph, try turning the radio. I also have trouble playing the radio during the day. We can't seem to pick up AM at Fox Hills. <laughs> You're not going to stand there, Alice, and tell me we cannot pick up a big station at like WCBS at Fox Hills. You're not going to tell me that, are you, Alice? The moon, Alice. How? Right in your kisser. <laughs> Come on, baby. Play for me. Ow. Just stand there, like the radio, like that. Are you crazy, Norton? I can't stand there, turning, holding and turning the radio. Go oh, pick it up, Ralphie boy. The show is beginning. No way, Norton. Maybe you guys can set up an, an antenna or something. Norton, quick, come back into your apartment. Bring back something we can use it as an antenna. Okay. Make it fast, Norton. Okay, but don't let the radio stop without me. <laughs> Take it or leave it with Phil Baker. Tonight we will be. Alice, Alice, can you come over here? Hold the radio over your head. Oh, okay, Ralph, but I, I really can't hold the radio too long. Are you sure I won't get a shot? To the moon, Alice, Alice, please hold this. Our future may depend on it. Ralph, here's the stuff. What do you want me to do with it? <laughs> you have to attach it to the antenna. Now, how can we attach it to the antenna? Oh no, Ralph. These suspenders were given to me by my mother. And Come on, go on. Now, maybe we picked any minute now. Well, I don't know, Ralph. In a short time, we will tell you the name that we have all been waiting for. But first, the commercial. Room Watchers present Bill Baker in Take It or Leave It. Remember, folks, there's nothing like a good ruin. It's playing, Ralphie boy. Keep holding the radio. We're so going to hold you so fast. someone really dearly, make sure to give her a gorgeous ruin. Now, back to Bill Baker. <laughs>
the winner, whose name I am about to pick out of the box, will not only win $64, but will be invited to come to Hollywood. And here I go. My arm is in the jaw with the names. And let me see now. I have the winning entry. And his name is... And his name is... Bob Brandon. You have exactly 10 minutes to call in to win. What did I tell you, Alice? What did I tell you? We did it, Ruffy boy. As we say in the sewer, there's Monday, right? Hollywood here and there. Come here, baby. You're the greatest. Ooh, how sweet it is. WCBS. Well, I don't know. With all that static, I was unable to hear it. <coughs> you have any suggestions for him? Why don't we call information? I'd spend all that money to get a phone number. Don't get crazy, boys. <laughs> well, you just won $64. You can spend some of it to call an operator. Well, if you say so, Alice. Hello, operator. Hi, uh, Can you please let me know the phone number of WCBS in Manhattan? This is an emergency. I am sorry, but I do not have that information. <laughs> please call the information operator to get that information. But operator, I only have five minutes left to make my call. Please help me. Well, let us not say that the telephone company does not have a part. I will try to get that number for you. <laughs> Thank you. Please hang on. One ringy dingy, two ringy dingy. Hello, Gertrude. How are you? Why,
Ruth is who he is. Please make up your mind that I win, that Ralph Brandon win. What was that you wanted us to do, Mr. Burrow? Your mind. Make up your mind. Make up your mind.
like to thank Marion Aronson, my co-director. Marion, raise your hand. Carolyn Connerton, are you in the audience? Would you stand, Carolyn, for doing a wonderful job? I want to thank the Walkenbergs for doing a wonderful job. that I would like to thank now. Audrey Steyer, would you come on down, please? Come on down.
So my suggestion is that how about give this half head for the chocolate and this half